it's like they held them one week and dropped them on you the next. As part of the trials and hardships of life. <laughs> We're going to skip a week on Esther and me and Micah tonight. Micah, chapter 1. I, I wanted to preach again through Micah and to begin our series in Esther last week, but there's one message in Micah, it really is an introductory message, that I just didn't want to miss. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I'll just preach this message. I think it's a helpful one, it gives us insight. And uh, anytime we can understand, the heart of God or God's purpose and intent in commandments or uh, in orders, things that God wants, will always be helped by it, you know. Um, obedience usually precedes understanding. Obedience usually precedes understanding, but there is a place of maturity in the life of a believer when you desire to understand so that um, obedience does not become merely a matter of a command and an action to follow the command, but obedience comes out of a desire to please God. Well, it's one thing, isn't it, to be willing to do what you ought to do, and for the motivation for that willingness to be, first of all, I don't want to have the problems of disobedience. There's nothing wrong at a basic level with the person saying, I had rather obey and not have problems than disobey and have consequences, right? Makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but there is also a level of obedience that becomes motivated by love. By saying, you know something, I, I love God. And I don't simply want, how are you going to help us make some more noise? Thank you. <laughs> I was like, we got to hear that thing. We get no point in letting that go. <laughs> Mr. Nice Guy. Nice guys always get picked on. That's what always happens, right, Charlie? <laughs> yeah. And Charlie looks sharp with that vintage brown tie. I just love that tie. All right, back to obedience. There's a big difference, though, or there's a major difference in maturity between a person who simply does what they ought to for sound motives and a person who does what they what they ought to or does more than they ought to with the motivation of love. Uh, you know the quote spiritual Christian always says, well did you do it just because it's right or did you do it because you love God? Well that is a good question. But right's right. You know, they make it as though, sometimes sound as though, well, you know, it's wrong to do it just because it's right. Or just to do it because you don't want problems. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with that, actually. But every good parent knows the difference between desirable behavior that is preparation for gaining a child's love, affections, and heart, and having a child's love, affections, and heart. In other words, there's a, there's a difference, isn't there? You, without the right behavior, you won't win the battle for the heart. If a child does, I, I, some parents think, well, I don't want them to obey unless they want to. Well, friend, they need to obey or they'll never want to. And so I want to look at this this evening. I want to look at something that God wants. And we're going to read in Micah chapter 1 and to verses uh, 1 through uh, one, 1 through 9, I guess, and we'll kind of just focus on verses that comment on this passage of Scripture. The word of the Lord that came to Micah the Morasite in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of His place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains shall be molten under Him and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. For the transgression of Jacob is all this and for the sins of the house of Israel. 
What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore I'll make Samaria as a heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof, and all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, I will make a wailing like the dragons, and mourning as the owls, for her wound is incurable. For it is come unto Judah, he has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Now let's read verse 5 again, because that's where we'll spend our time this evening. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Father, I pray that you would help us to understand high places tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Eight kings in Israel and Judah attempted to destroy the high places. And out of the eight that set about to destroy the high places, two succeeded. And it's always surprising to me, it's always astonishing to me as you read through First and Second Kings. If you want to thematically understand or separate the elements of 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings from God's perspective is a commentary on the success and failure of the kings of Israel and Judah to destroy the high places. 1st and 2nd Kings is a commentary. In other words, this king did this and this and this and this and this, and this king rebuilt the high places. Or this king didn't do this, neither did he tear down the high places. And I want to look at high places tonight. I want us to understand uh, what God is speaking of. So to understand the high places, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12 tonight, and let's look at what God says, and we'll define high places. What shocks me in verse 5 is the question about Judah. Where is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Is it not Jerusalem? Before we get too far into it, let me just say that today, the church has for Jerusalem created a high place. I believe that the church and her understanding of Israel today is a high place. A contemporary high place. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, I mean... What's happening in Jerusalem today, God is not doing. And yet, we as believers oftentimes worship and are fascinated with what's happening in Jerusalem. In the same way that Israel always has been as well. We're going to look at that this evening. Here we are in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let's read verse 1 all the way down to verse, uh, to verse 5. Um, these are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Well, that's pretty uh, clear, isn't it? How long does God want Israel to keep the statutes? All the days that you live upon the earth. Okay? Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven image of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put His name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shall thou shalt come. Where did God put his name? In the tabernacle of the congregation. It is more than ironic, it is more than coincidental that the holy mount 
in Jerusalem has there the church of the sepulcher, that it has there the wall that Israel worships, and that it has there a mosque to the God of Islam. Because, my friend, that place has been and presently is a high place. And only two short times in history has it really technically been otherwise. You say, Pastor, no, for a long period of time only the temple was there. Does anyone remember our recent series in Ezekiel? When the elders came into Ezekiel's house and sat before him, does anyone remember what God showed Ezekiel in the vision about these men? The high places in the temple. My friend, the very people who worshipped in the temple had their secret societies back then where they would go and do their pagan things and worship in their pagan high places. And it's a little astonishing to us. I think sometimes... Because perhaps, I think it's primarily through ignorance. Sometimes we don't quite understand, one, what a high place is. And two, we don't understand what the problem always was with Israel and Jerusalem. But it was the high place. What is a high place? A high place is a place that previously to God giving the land to Israel was a place of heathen worship, pagan worship for the Canaanites. In other words, it was a location where the Canaanites worshipped uh, before God. There's application here, and it's not just an aside, it's practical. You know, as Christians, we need to really, really thoroughly reject pagan, traditional forms, formats of worship. Um... <laughs> I'm for a church being in any facility that has been cleansed. By cleansed, what do you mean? I mean, uh, well, I, I'd be fine with occupying an old bar for a church facility. I know of a, of a ministry that bought out an abortion clinic. Bought the property, kicked the abortion clinic out, and started printing Bibles there. Uh, you know, I'm for, I like it, what is it, Voltaire? His home is used as a, either a Bible museum or was used for some period of time for something to print Bibles or something like that. I'm all for those kind of things. But I'll tell you what I'm not for. I'm not for syncretism. You know, if, if as a church, sometime we purchase an old Catholic building, you know what we're going to do? We're going to break the stained glass right out of there. Throw it away. You say, Pastor, when you sell it at auction, some of it's valuable. No, I'm going to throw rocks through it. Break it. If uh, there are uh, statues and icons on the, on the walls, and in their little cubby holes, and there's little rooms of confessionals and so forth, I'll knock the walls down and destroy any semblance. We're not going to go into the place and worship God in truth because the place is a high place. That's why as Christians sometimes I'm troubled by people calling places places of importance. I grew up uh, hearing, don't run in the sanctuary. You know what a sanctuary is? It's a high place. Uh, this is a, you know, don't do this in the chapel or don't do this. And we, when we have a little bit of an awe or a mysticism about a location. Now, I don't, don't misunderstand me. Sometimes, sometimes I like to reminisce in a place about the things God has done there. I'm not saying you and I can't go to a place and remember something or have a memorial. Right? I mean, there's a difference between a memorial and a high place, though, isn't there? A high place is where we expect, well, I'm in this location, therefore something's going to happen here or something is. No, a memorial is a place where we say something did happen here. But you and I have to recognize that the God of Israel, the God of, uh, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who said, I will be worshipped only in the tabernacle, is a God that wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And He is not content to have any kind of a mixture or mysticism where a place has a credit. Do you get that this evening? In other words, 
it isn't necessarily the idol was worshipped in the place. It's the location where the idol was worshipped. And people have that sentiment in their heart towards something there. And there's a real danger here. And God was very, very clear in Deuteronomy 12 about what He did not want to see happen in Israel. And it's a little bit of a reflection to me as I read verse 5 of Micah chapter 1. And God asked the question, Where's the high places of Judah? He said, Is it not Jerusalem? Jerusalem was not known as a center for pagan worship, was it? When you went to the Temple Mount, how many buildings were there in the days of Hezekiah? One. And in that day, God told the prophet Micah, He said, that's a high place! Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Christians, so many times we are so slick about dotting our I's and crossing our T's and doing something externally while something else entirely is happening, happening internally. It's troublesome to me uh, when people become traditional or they become attached to a place. You know, in the South, there are graveyards of the churches and there are people that are discontent in their churches and yet they won't move because they've got bones of a loved one in the graveyard. And so they, that's where their ancestors and their family and their heritage is. And my friend, I'll tell you something. There are a lot of believers who recognize that the churches which they attend don't hold to this book. And yet they stay to sing in the choir. How many of us have heard of that? And if they stay because they teach in the Sunday school class, how many of us have heard of that? And yet they, and you could just go on and on and on and on, and they say, yes, I know this isn't right. Yes, I know I oughtn't to. And I'll tell you what it is. It's a high place. Maybe it's an old religious leader. Maybe it's someone who uh, was well known in the past and there's still a connection there. Whatever it is, friend, it can be a high place can be a place where you are not worshiping God who is alive and who is present and who is either pleased or displeased. Did you hear me in that statement, the qualification? God is either pleased or displeased. There are Christians who are literally in a system, and maybe it's a church. I've seen it. I've seen where churches have gotten away from preaching the Word of God, and they've got more into following men. And they have literally broken commandments of the Scripture. They literally are displeasing God, but because of you know it being at the church back in the day, there are people that are there. And I'll tell you what it is. It's a high place. It's a high place. Christian, worshiping God ought to be fresh. It ought to be contemporary. Do you hear me? I believe in contemporary worship. I don't think we worship a traditional God. I think we worship an alive God who is as alive as we are, and that's what contemporary means. I want that word back. I'm starting, I think, I think we ought to just start advertising ourselves as a contemporary church. We're contemporary. They're stuck in the culture. Andrew's like, oh, Pastor, if you do that, you know what people will think? Yeah, I wasn't worried about people will think that's a high place, Andrew. <laughs> now the reality of it friend is that God's real God's alive and what God did yesterday or what God might do in the future or what God did in this culture or this trend or this time it's all just a high place see what we worship is the God so many times we can get sentimental about something you know God took the Ark of the Covenant away from Israel you know why? It was a high place. They would take an object and they'd worship the object, but they wouldn't worship God. You and I, believer, need to be careful about this. Well, I want to look at some kings this evening, some commentary on a few kings uh, who tried to destroy the high places, and out of eight of them, only uh, two actually did. First Kings chapter 15. Will you go there with me? First Kings chapter 15. Again, what's a high place? Well, a high place is a location 
where something was done that was pagan, that was not truth, and where that location is used as a location, quote, to worship God. And that's what Samaria became. Samaria became Israel's alternative to Jerusalem. 1 Kings chapter, uh, what did I say, verse, uh, 1 Kings chapter 15, that's where I'm at. Um, verse 9, In the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers have had made. Now I want to read back over that again. I want us to notice uh, the, the description. He took away the Sodomites of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Now does that sound pretty thorough? Listen, I'll give you a rubber stamp. I'll give you a star. I'll give you five stars out of five. This fellow did a good job, didn't he? As king in Israel. And the Bible says in verse 13, And also Melchah his mother, even her he removed from being queen, because she made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. He said, Mom, you can't behave like that. She said, I'm your mother. And he said, Well, you're not going to worship idols and be queen. You're gone. He stood up to his mom, and I have met rarely men who will do that. I can... <laughs> I'm just telling you, I have the utmost respect for a man that will stand up to his mom. I didn't say disrespect his mom, but stand up to his mom. I have seen many men compromise and cave that which is right because of their wife or their mother, more their mother than their wife. Many, very few men will stand up to their mother, and, and Asa did. But the Bible says in verse 14, but the high places were not removed. In other words, as good as a king as he was, and the fact that he removed the high places and the Sodomites and his mom, he didn't get them taken out. And the Bible says, nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Um, he brought in the things which his father had dedicated, the things which himself had dedicated in the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. Now, let's, let's look at that. Verse 15 or 14. That's amazing, isn't it? The Bible says Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. So here's a man that we could agree, couldn't we, from the Scripture tonight, didn't sin against God in worshiping in the high places. I, I guarantee you, Asa didn't go down to his mom's grove and secretly worship there. <coughs> Asa was innocent of worshiping in the high places, of having a syncretic worship of God. He didn't go to the temple and worship God and then while he was there, drop a dime in a corner for an idol. Asa worshiped God. But I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't deal with the things that couldn't be seen. The high places. He didn't deal with the, with the invisible things. Now, I'll tell you something, Christian. You want a characteristic of a high place that's invisible. See, you can usually see an idol, but you can't see a high place. It's invisible. It can be there in somebody's heart and you'll never identify it. You'll never identify it. And Asa did a real good job as a king, but he didn't look for the things he didn't see. He didn't say, what's the problem here in Israel? What's going on? What's, why is it that I'm trying to lead these people and I love God with all my heart and they don't love God with all their hearts? High places. High places. Christian, I could list high places in Christianity, but you could do it just as well. I could list high places in Christianity, all the good things. This and this and this and this. You know, you can get a pretty good idea when you just try to talk to people about worship. High place is a place of worship. And when people say, well, I want this when I worship, you know what you usually could do? 
you could put it in all caps. You could put H I G H space P L A C E. High place. Usually. Well, this is what I want in life. I'm willing to serve God. I'm willing to be a faithful church member. I'm willing to whatever. And you know what you can do? You can spell it out in all caps. H-I-G-H space P-L-A-C-E. High place. Christian, the high place is that separation between truth and appearance. Understanding worship of a high place is really understanding the difference between truth and appearance. See, you could march right up to the temple and if you've gone through the process that you were supposed to, to be able to go into the temple, you could go right into the temple. And you could do everything that everyone would think and yet you could have one man that would go in and he'd be like an Asa and you'd have another man that would go in and he'd be completely wrong because he'd be going in to worship the high place. He'd be there for the building. Asa would be there for God. Let's look at some more kings. Second Kings, I believe it's 20... Uh, uh, first Kings, I mean to say. Chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22. Verse 41. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was thirty and five years old when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and five years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shehili, or Shilhi. And he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. What was the commentary on Asa? What? Yeah, his heart was perfect with the Lord. What did he do? Destroyed the idols. Didn't destroy the high places. Destroyed the idols. What else did he get rid of? The Sodomites. He cleaned the land. He cleaned up. And his son didn't swerve. Uh, you want to preach about parenting, you could use Asa. He's a good example. A lot of the kings were lousy parents, but here's a king that had a son that the Bible's commentary about him was he's just like his daddy. And that's a good thing. But he never destroyed the high places. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting that in Micah, while Hezekiah is still a good king in Israel, it's interesting that God tells Micah, I am going to melt Jerusalem because of the high places. And they had pretty good kings at the time. Isn't it interesting? That's a little different than most of the prophecy. Most of the prophecy, Israel's in the captivity, or Israel's on her way to captivity, but she has a terrible king that's taught the people to sin, and it's not high places, it's, it's full-blown idolatry. It is forsaking Jerusalem. But under these men who were good kings, Micah warns the people, or I'm mean, sorry, Micah warns the people, hey, listen, the high place is still a big problem. You know, this is a message for the choir, folks. Idolatry is a message for the idolaters, but high places is a message for the choir. You know, a lot of times I want to preach about things in church, and I think, well, the folks that need to hear that message won't be there. <laughs> I think I don't want to beat up the, the people that are there, but I'm telling you, we need to hear preaching about high places. The regulars, the faithful, need to hear preaching about the high places because if if Asa was so perfect, so faithful that the Bible says he was perfect in his heart before God, and yet he didn't destroy the high places, and God said he was going to melt Jerusalem because of it, it's a problem. You know, I think sometimes that yes, sir. You think Asa knew uh, about the high places, or no? I don't think he did. I think what Asa knew was what he did, but I think Asa should have known. And there's the difference. Yeah, Asa, yeah, he, uh, he dealt with what he knew about. I'm telling you, you, can't, you God wouldn't say he walked before the Lord God in all his days 
and have him know about something. No, he didn't know about it, and that was the problem. See, the problem sometimes Christians is, is we, we systematize. We figure out what we need to do, and we're right about it, and we do it, and we're faithful about it, and it's good, and it pleases the Lord. But sometimes what we don't do is try to find the extras. We don't try to, to dig out, okay, what else is there, Lord? You know, it's, it's, it's an enlightening question to ask yourself, when's the last time I went digging for something new? When's the last time that I said, Lord, you know, I've given you all my heart, I've done everything you've called me to do, and I'm willing of anything, but God, go ahead and expose something I'm not aware of. And mostly as believers, we're willing, aren't we? We don't want to have blatant sin in our lives. We don't want to be in rebellion. We don't want to have the consequences of sin. But as we said in our introduction, there is a difference between an individual who obeys for good reasons and an individual that just really tries to get a hold of the heart of God and find out what it's all about and do more than he's ever asked. If you could correctly define piety, that would be it. Or sometimes we think of pious as a synonymous word with hypocrisy. But piety would be a person who would really desire holiness. And they would just really desire to be holy God. It's holy gods, completely gods. There's a big difference between not messing up and doing good. Isn't there? If you ever play team sports, one of the things you know is that team players, any player on a team, you know, sometimes you just have a guy and he, and he just has a bad night. Sometimes you have a guy that, you know, he doesn't just have a, uh, he, he, he has a real good night. And one of the things you know for sure is that he's not going to do, he's not going to have, you know, he's not going to play the same level all the time. Just sometimes things are going to go better. If it's basketball, sometimes you know that lousy shot will rattle in instead of rattling out. And it seemed like more go in instead of go out. Sometimes it seems like he takes the same shots and there's nothing wrong with them and he misses them all. I watched the Miami Heat game last night and I watched Joe Johnson take, I think, about 10 really good shots. I mean, he, he, he moved to the hoop, he got in, he got position, and he really would have caused, uh, who are they playing? Uh, the, the Hornets. He would really cause the Hornets a lot of trouble if his shots had just gone in. But they just didn't go in. And I mean, I, you, you look at him and you think he needs, you want to say he needs to quit shooting, but there was nothing wrong with the shots he was shooting. He, they, he needed to do what he was doing. They just didn't go in. And you know, I've watched him play games where, they, I mean, his shots just go in. And Dwayne Wade was the same way that night. But I'll tell you this. Uh, Steph Curry this year, talking about basketball, he has made more half-court free or three-point shots than any player in the history of basketball. It's not even close. But you know something else about Steph Curry? He's attempted more half-court three-point shots. Now, when does a guy shoot from the half-court? At the end of the game, at the buzzer. You know why some guys don't shoot? They got the ball and they decide, well, they shoot, but they wait till the buzzer goes off and then they take their shot? Because they don't want to mess up their stats. Steph Curry doesn't care about stats. He's still got him, but he doesn't care about it. He takes. He says, "I want to. I want to hit a shot." In other words, he's more, more. He's more concerned about putting points on the board for his team than he is with looking good. The fact of the matter is that it may hurt his stats, but hey, if you got the ball and you can take a shot, you need to take a shot. And there's a big difference in in the way that you play that way, isn't there? Now, who'd you rather have on your team? A guy who's padding his stats or a guy that's trying to put points on the board for his team? Give me the team guy any day. You know, sometimes as Christians, I think we're padding stats. In other words, the game's perfect. I mean, you could say, well, he should have taken that shot, but you can't prove it. You know, well, he didn't have time to get the shot off or it just, you know, it did. well, that wasn't an error. There's a difference between a Christian who's at trying to win, trying to, trying to figure out what God's trying to do and trying to figure out how to do it, and somebody saying, well, what am I supposed to do? 
It's frustrating sometimes trying to lead people who are concerned with being correct more than they're concerned with just getting the job done. Sometimes correctness becomes a high place. In other words, it isn't about what's God trying to do? Let's get, you know, and by the way, I'm not talking about we need to have free license to just do whatever we want with God's will. But I mean, if I know what God's trying to do, there's a big difference between knowing what I'm supposed to do and knowing what God's trying to get accomplished because I'm on the team. Now, if I'm playing on a team and the coach said, now here's what I want to do. I want the bigs to get down low. And I want to really, really, really pound the ball inside. And I want to be a constant threat inside. And then if uh, the ball gets kicked out to the perimeter, then we can shoot threes. But that's not what we're trying to do, folks. We're trying to just beat them up down low. We're trying to play a physical, fundamental, hard game. That's my game, by the way. That's what I like to play. Well, I'll tell you what I want to do. Hey, listen, I may not be the guy down low, but I'm going to try that extra thing, try to get the ball down low. If that's the, if that's the game, if that's what we're trying to do, you say, well, but you had a shot you could have taken. Yeah, but that extra pass made it all the better. Sometimes as Christians, sometimes we're more concerned with making sure we don't get benched because we didn't succeed or we didn't look good we're more concerned with how the crowd perceives us than we are with how the team perceives us. You know, Eric Spolster, again, using basketball as the analogy this year, he said, you know, he said, a guy like Lou Aldang, when he scores 31 points, he said, you notice him. He said, but I'm telling you, you know, the, the plus minus averages when he's on the floor, that's what makes him a great player. He doesn't look impressive when he's out there, but it's all the things that he's doing to make the other players successful that makes him a good player. And that's the attitude of a guy who wants the team to win. Christian, I believe as, as Christians that the difference between a guy who puts away the idols and gets the sodomites out of the land and worships in Drew himself and the guy who says, Lord, what else is there? What's the problem around here? What are we going to do? It's the difference between most of these kings and, the, and we're going to go ahead and just cut to the chase and look at two other ones. Second Kings chapter 23. We're not going to look at all of them. Let's look at two, the two that, that put away the high places. 2 Kings chapter 23. And um, I'm sorry? Uh, just making sure I find the right location. Yeah, this is it. Okay, let's read verses 1 through 3. There the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. This is Josiah, by the way. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant of which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. Let's look at verse 15. More with the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made, which who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place, he broke down and burned the high place and stamped it to small powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. And then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it's a sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. 
So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. He had a little discernment about him, didn't he? But I'm telling you, he went to, he went to these places where they had made an altar at Bethel. And uh, boy, Bethel had some great places. Study Bethel in, in the Bible, by the way. Because of that, I wouldn't name my church Bethel Baptist Church, would you? I just wish that uh, believers who come up with these, quote, Bible named churches would read all the Bible before they name their church. I think it's pretty smart just to name your church after the location that it's at and, uh, you know, and just let the whole locations thing, um, just let it go. Because Josiah destroyed Bethel. Because Josiah destroyed the altar, which uh, the high place that Jeroboam had made. And he looked around and he saw the sepulchers of, of, of good people. And he burned them. Friend, <laughs> you'll notice around this church you don't see the name Ryan Price on anything except for Luke. <laughs> <laughs> You know why that is? You know why we don't have pastor's name on the church van, on the church sign, on all those things? You know, I'd hate it if some of y'all became old codgers and got stuck on the way things were when Pastor Price was there. Because that'd be a high place. You know, in my office, I have my certificate of ordination on the wall, but I don't have a college diploma or seminary diploma on my wall. You know why that is? Because I don't want to get stuck with a high place. When I sign my name, I don't sign my name with some kind of a title. When I introduce myself, I don't say I'm thus and so. I'm pastor. Because God called me to be pastor. It's appropriate to call me pastor. But I don't have to be called pastor. Because that can become a high place. Sometimes we can get so into You've got to call the preacher, preacher, man of God. Men ought to be men of God. That's got nothing to do with a particular office or position. And that can become a high place. It's really easy, isn't it? For people that just nail it. Guys like Asa, his grandson, Jehoshaphat. It's, it's easy for him to just live right and do right, but just kind of miss the heart behind it. And as I said in the beginning, there's a difference between obedience and a heart for obedience. Oh, God isn't going to hold you accountable for what you could have known when you did what you're supposed to. But there's a big difference between somebody who wants to know, isn't there? And somebody who just says, you know, God, anything you tell me, I'll do. Hey, give me, God give us a church full of people that say, whatever you tell me, I'll do, Lord. But I'm telling you, if you give us a few that say, Lord, whatever you tell me, and then whatever I can find out. There's a big difference in that heart. Well, what do I have to do? My goodness, what a question. Sometimes our obedience can become a high place in that kind of an instance. One last person. We're finished this evening. I hope we've gotten to where we're going. Uh, chapter, uh, oh my. Oh yeah. Chapter 14, Second Kings, or chapter um, I wrote some things down. I'm not sure the order in which I wrote them down. So let me let me let me get myself collected here. Get it right. Chapter 22 and verse 43. I think we already looked at that one, didn't we? Mm-hmm. No, that's that's in First Kings. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. Okay. Chapter 18 and verse 5 of the Second Kings. If this would be before Josiah. I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now it came to pass in the third year of chapter, verse 1 of chapter 18 of Hosea the son of Hosea the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, 
the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Isn't that something? Now, you ever wish that that brazen serpent was around? You know what happened to the brass serpent? It became a high place. It became a high place. It's a picture of the cross. It's a picture of the cross. It is the illustration that Jesus used for faith in God. But the picture became a high place. The Bible says he broke down the brazen, breaking pieces, the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. Now let's look at that final phrase and let's make that our conclusion. The Bible said he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah. Isn't that something? After him there was none like him. And the Bible said, nor any that were before him. Now what I want to conclude with this evening, my friend, is I want us to differentiate between obedience and the kind of obedience that seeks out and destroys high places. Do you think any spiritual person might have had an argument with Hezekiah when he broke up the brass serpent? I mean, was it an important part of Israel's history? The brass serpent, the serpent in the wilderness? I mean, people today say it never existed because they don't know where it is. Well, I'll tell you why they say that, because he destroyed it. Don't you think we ought to just keep it just so that we can remember what God did in the wilderness? Don't you think it ought to be a memorial for these people of what happens when you complain against God? Don't you think? Don't you think? And, Je and Hezekiah said, I know what I think. I think this is a high place. And we're going to break it up. And Christian, in one generation, what may have been a good thing in the next generation can be a high place. It just can. So easily can. And you and I as believers need to get our pulse on God's heart. So we really kind of understand. I mean, who told Hezekiah that? What prophet came and said, break up the brass serpent that God had Moses put up? Who told Hezekiah that? Nobody. But Hezekiah knew what a high place was. And nobody had to tell him. Do you get that? No one said, hey, Hezekiah, break that up. But Hezekiah knew what a high place, and so he broke it up. Too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Applies to high places. In other words, hey, it may have been good for this generation, but it's not good for this generation. You know, I try to be that way in the ministry, God helping me. You know, just because we did something in the past doesn't mean we have to keep doing or doing the future. Just because it worked back then doesn't need, mean it needs to work now. You know, sometimes uh, sometimes you may not know it, but things that were good, things that others did, we don't do, and there's a reason for it. And usually the reason is high place. High place. <laughs> uh, Pastor, why don't we have a choir in our church? Well, because people don't show up to practice. Well... Partly that, but you know what? I could push it hard enough. If I push choir more than I push visitation, we could have choir instead of visitation. But it'd be a high place. You get that? Pastor, why don't we have more special music in our church? I hope we do someday. And we could, actually, if we worked harder at it. If I push special music more than I pushed church planting, we could have special music. But we wouldn't have church planting. And so special music would be a high place. Do you see how we could go with this, my friend? It doesn't mean everything is a high place. It doesn't mean, oh, you can't have special music. It's a high place. No, you can have special music if it isn't a high place. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you hear it? 
And friend, there's a difference between knowing what God says thou shalt and thou shalt not about and knowing what God's trying to do enough that you could say, well, this is a distraction from what God's trying to do. And so it's a high place. And I hope that's a help to you this evening. I want to preach through Micah, and I really, it didn't, the, 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 the way we were doing the series didn't fit. We began Esther. But I just said, you know what, I'm going to preach this message. We're going to go back, and we're just, maybe not going to preach all the way through Micah, but we're going to understand what a high place is. And I hope that, that the Lord's helped us this evening as a ministry to maybe be a little more discerning than we could have been before about what really pleases God in obedience. Father, I pray that You would help us tonight to be discerning, to be wise about these matters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. I like that look.